the body part need not be made of flesh and bone for it to be part of self. Imagine that you're, you're 75 and you go to your local store and you buy these bionic shoes and you walk out as, as you've walked when you were 18. Hello, I'm Sue Nelson and welcome to the Create the Future podcast brought to you by the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering. There are many reasons why people become engineers, teachers, parents, role models for Professor Hugh Hare, an engineer and biophysicist at MIT's Media Lab in the United States. It was personal tragedy. In 1982, at the age of 17, Hugh was mountaineering with a friend when a fierce snowstorm interrupted their climb. After a harrowing few days, they were eventually rescued, but frostbite and later gangrene resulted in both of Hugh's legs being amputated. It happened just a couple of years after the end of a hugely popular TV series called The Bionic Man, about a badly injured astronaut whose body was famously rebuilt better than it was before. The idea of this type of enhanced body repair technology at the time of Hughes' accident, though, was mere science fiction. But today, Time magazine has deemed Hugh the leader of the bionic age, as his work on prosthetics has transformed lives, including his own. But we began our conversation at the point shortly after that accident as a teenager and a description from him of what his first pair of prosthetic legs were like. They were absolutely terrible. They were made of foam and wood and carbon composite. Absolutely no computer on board, no sensors, no muscle tendon like actuators, simply passive devices that were non-adaptive. And were they comfortable? No, they were excruciatingly painful, actually. And I said to my clinicians at the time, are you joking? Is this the only thing that's available? Um, and sadly, it was the only thing that was available. And was this what made you then apply your mind to, well, I'm, I'm going to have to live with this device, with these devices. I can do better. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, When I realized how pathetic and unsophisticated current technology was in the 1980s in the realm of prosthetics, I I really began thinking and and inventing uh, in the realm of prostheses to improve the state of the art. So what were your first improvements? What did you find, you know, that you could sort of immediately do that would make, make a difference? Well, I'm very goal oriented. So my first goal was to return to mountain climbing. So my first design objective was to design my own legs uh, for the vertical world of rock and ice climbing. So I developed feet where I could sm- stand on small rock edges, feet that would wedge into small rock fissures, feet that were spiked, that would penetrate an ice wall, enabling me to ascend a sheer vertical expanse. Is this because you were told that, yes, you'll be able to walk again with these legs, but there's no way you could use those legs to climb rocks? Yeah, I was told that by my my physical therapy physician uh, at the time. He said I I would not uh, not be able to ride a bicycle. I would use require hand controls to drive a car, and I would most certainly not be able to return to mountain climbing. He was so wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And other than the the connections that you could then adapt the particularly the feet to get into particular crevices what for you was the bit that could actually make them more comfortable because i'm trying to think that's a lot of pressure isn't it in terms of the human body on a very small part of of the leg i would contend that if you ask a thousand people with limb loss um what's the one problem they have with their prosthesis or the most dominant problem probably all thousand would say that the their limbs hurt them and that to please fix the poor fit so we're my team at mit we are continually working on that problem and we've made tremendous progress and in fact i'm i'm standing right now on interfaces that uh, my team has developed and they're very comfortable 
And so what have you done then to, to improve that, that comfort? Because obviously somebody's body mass and, and the pressure, that's not going to change. So what have you designed that makes it more comfortable? Yeah, so for thousands of years, you know, going back to ancient Egypt, the technique for fitting devices to the human body was artisanal based, very, very simplistic, wherein a mold was taken of the part of the body for which you want to interface. And then based on that mold, a device interface was, was developed by carving and cutting and sculpting. That's a process that's artisanal, does not enable you know, advanced technology and so on. So what we're doing now is we're using um, imaging. So we use CT or MRI and various other imaging modalities to measure in detail the geometries of the tissue of the residuum. So we create an actual mathematical model of the body for which we want to interface to. In the case of amputation, it's the amputated residuum. We then, once the, that body part is in the, in the computer, if you will, we then use uh, what's called finite element analysis, a physics-based approach to uh, designing a interface around that biomechanical model. And because this is all done in, in the computer, we can rapidly uh, try different designs of interfaces and not try three designs like in the world's world of atoms, but try hundreds of designs because we can do do that with very fast computers in terms of virtual prototyping. And then when we find optimality, then we 3D print the interface. So that's a whole pipeline where you end up with a fit that's deeply personal to the individual, that's very, very precise to their anatomy. And as well as that, you're also, I mean, what's, I think, I think for me anyway, is when you watch people wearing your devices, your prosthesis, is, is how natural it looks in terms of how people walk. Right. Yeah, my, my group at MIT, we were the first to develop a, an, a bionic limb, a bionic leg that restores natural gait meaning that if you put a person in a black box and you can only measure their walking speed and how much metabolic energy they're using, you would not be able to tell whether they have biological legs or synthetic legs, which was quite an quite interesting point in human history. <laughs> that's, yes, that's an understatement. And I've seen people virtually in, in tears, in relief in terms of the difference it's made to their lives so you've got this connection how did you get this connection because you need the electrical connection from the brain to the device right there's different interfaces between the the bionic limb and the body one is mechanical which we've talked about already and a, and a second is as electrical or neural so as you state can we connect the bionic limb the synthetic computation on the bionic limb to the human nervous system and can we do so bidirectionally, where a person can think and, and influence the output of the, of the synthetic motors on the bionic limb, and can it go the other way where sensors on the bionic limb, when you touch them, those signals actually go into the nervous system, giving the person with amputation a natural sensation of the position of the limb in space, as well as cutaneous touch pursuing that that interface with the with nerves and muscles and how long does that take is that something that's individual to each person and do they have to sort of practice it and, and learn it in terms of focusing right i am now going to move my right foot even no not at all if you design the neural interface well uh, it's completely natural and intuitive so the, the whole design objective is that there is, it, it is without learning. It is completely immediate and intuitive. You've spent your career working and, and all your sort of, you know, your education goes through all the necessary aspects, whether it's physics or the mechanical engineering or the, the biophysics as well, and devices has sort of led you to this point. 
obviously that terrible accident was a sort of defining moment of your life because it's it sets you on this career path it's a very single vision you you have to begin with was it to sort of i want to you know like you said i want to go go i want to climb again when did it become i want to help everybody else now yeah that's a very very interesting question so you're absolutely correct that had the accident not occurred, I would have never been where I'm sitting today. Uh, I had no interest in technology. I had no interest in science. I had no interest in school for that matter prior to my accident. I think the experience of the accident, building myself limbs to return to climbing and actually succeeding to a remarkable level where I could climb at a more advanced level after the accident with synthetic limbs than I could ever achieve before the accident with normal biological limbs. That experience was so inspirational because I realized the power of technology to heal, to rehabilitate, in my own case, to actually extend human physicality beyond innate capabilities. And it was that inspiration that, that drove me towards a whole a whole career, a whole uh, focus in, in bionic technology and to provide that gift of movement, that gift of a body that, that n is no longer limited to, to all of humanity. I mean, you know, I know you've had the comparisons before with the bionic man, but when you were saying that, I did get the uh, build you back better than before. <laughs> I mean, it, it does sound like that. That must have been quite a high in all sense of the word, when you were climbing and realizing, wow, I'm doing something I couldn't have done before. It was extraordinary. One of the greatest experiences of my life. And what sort of responses have you had personally from people who have been able to do this for the first time who might have thought that that was it? They would not be able to walk naturally again. Yeah, in terms of walking and movement, you know, either either the person begins giggling uh, out of joy or they begin crying out of joy. <laughs> you, one, one sees both responses. In terms of the neural connection, the connection to the brain, it's very interesting that when a when a person can can think and move the bionic limb, they can actually feel the bionic limb moving as a natural limb they actually view the limb in a different way. It's no longer a tool to them. It becomes part of them, part of their body. And they say things like, I now feel complete. They say, it's my leg, even though it's made of titanium and silicone and, and carbon composite. So what we've learned and what we are learning in the field is that a body part need not be made of flesh and bone for it to be part of self uh, and completely natural. Does this take advantage of the brain's ability with some people that, that who've had a loss of a, a, a limb, they, they call it the phantom limb syndrome, where they feel as though it's there when it's not there. Is, is that sort of using that ability of the human mind to imagine in a way? Yeah, it's, it's based on actual sensory information. So proprioception, a, a lot of proprioception comes from biological sensors in muscles and tendons. The muscles and tendons are filled with sensors that measure the length of the muscle, the force borne on the muscle. And by extension, they're sensing the position of your joint and how much force is on your joint or torque. So what we do is when we amputate the limb, we create these agonist antagonist muscle pairs so that when a person moves the, the phantom joint, those physical muscles in the real world are moving and sending sensory information to the brain, telling the brain that the joint is moving. And then when we attach the bionic joint and the person looks down and sees with their eyes the bionic joint moving and they feel it in their brain, you close the loop and it's a complete sensory experience and a, a providing the person a, a neurological embodiment or an ownership. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Do you test your own prototypes out yourself? 
I usually do, but our recent design expeditions, if you will, uh, have gone into the realm of regenerative medicine and surgery. And I've, I personally have yet to receive these regenerative and surgical techniques applied to my own body. I will in the future. So for the first time, uh, I, I, I'm not cutting edge, but the <laughs> subjects of my studies are cutting edge. And how do they, the connections, how do the, the sort of connections to the nervous system, how, how is that done? Is it purely by external sensors attached to the skin? Yes, so far we're doing non-invasive skin sensors, but uh, in the future we want to implant small magnetic beads into, into these muscles. And then using magnetic field sensors on the skin, we can compute the mathematics uh, and figure out where the beads in and th- are, are in three-dimensional space. And by doing so, we can track the length and speed of the moving muscle. So as the person thinks, as these muscles are moving dynamically uh, and they're perceiving their phantom joints moving, we're actually sensing that movement with very high accuracy. And then that's commanded to the motors in the bionic limb. So the joint moves in exactly an appropriate way as if the limb were intact. And is it is any particular injury easier to deal with than another? For instance, is it easier having an entire, say, prosthetic leg as opposed to maybe just from the ankle down or, or maybe just yeah. several fingers? Yeah, absolutely. You're exactly correct. The, the, the more distal is the language we would use, the lower down the amputation, uh, the easier it is to emulate with a prosthesis. And the and distinction, the more high, high up or proximal the amputation, the more challenging it is for the technology. And where do you see the technology going further in, in terms of, you know, do you think there's, there's now nothing that this technology can't do? I, I know that you've been working with, with exoskeletons as well. Do you see the future then for even an able-bodied person? to be constantly or enhanced if they want to. Yeah, absolutely. So it, re- regarding amputation, before we put a period on that discussion, I, I do think in two to three decades, we will have bionic limbs that completely emulate biological function, even, even for very proximal high amputations. And we'll have many examples of augmentation where the bionic limb actually affords the person an enhancement that's not achievable with uh, mere flesh and bone. But yeah, for, for persons with quote unquote normal limbs, um, yeah, exoskeletons are, are robots that you wear. They wrap around the limb and exert forces on, on the limb to augment jumping height and walking and running and so on. My lab is, is developing such technology. I also have a, a new startup company called Defy. Uh, Defy is very much pushing the boundaries of what's possible with exoskeletons. So I believe in, the, in a decade, um, it'll be common to walk down the street in a major city and see people wearing bionics, um, augmentative robotic platforms that are reducing their musculoskeletal stress, lowering their energy rates, enabling them to move faster, uh, more agile than is possible with, with their biological bodies. And this could be particularly helpful for aging because that's one of the things that, that goes, isn't it, in terms of people's knees go, their hips go, arthritis. Yeah, yeah so we're, one thing we're working on is a bionic shoe that enhances the extension of the ankle called plantar flexion of the ankle. So it turns out arguably the most important muscle in the human leg for for walking is the calf muscle because it, it injects enormous amounts of energy and power into the walking gait. And what happens is as people age, the calf muscle degrades and is not as strong, not as powerful as that muscle was when the person was 18. And the result of that is a very high musculoskeletal stress 
when the leg hits the ground with every walking step, without that robust calf muscle, there tends to be a lot of stress emanating up the leg, uh, the knee and hip and lower back, and that drives um, joint disease. So osteoarthritis of the knee is, is a dominant reason why the elderly cannot get around comfortably in a bipedal way. And so if we have bionic exoskeletons, we can essentially put 18-year-old calf muscles on everyone, independent of their age, and dramatically mitigate joint disease in the elderly. That would transform society, wouldn't it? Because so many people are um, medication for pain for, the, for this sort of thing. And imagine that it was readily available. Imagine that you're, you're 75 and you go to your local store, either online or a brick and mortar store, and you buy these bionic shoes and you walk out as, as you've walked when you were 18. Imagine that. That's the world we want to create. Is it easy to commercialize? the work that you're, you're doing at the MIT lab? Um, it's, <laughs> it's never easy to commercialize. <laughs> every, every product I commercialize, I, I have a new, a new set of gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> and it typically takes me about a decade to commercialize a product. So it's, it's very hard, but uh, of course, it, it's very, very uh, worthwhile indeed. Now, it's, it's funny, you know, I normally ask guests, you know, what their advice would be to to those who want to be an engineer and and, and often people that you know that say it's about studying science studying maths and and we've just heard you say you weren't interested in science or engineering at all when you were younger so maybe i'll rephrase that question and well, say I, I been, had i been exposed to it I would have <laughs> ah yes yeah we obviously got a talent more than a talent for it yeah. but um how about i rephrase the question and say what is it about the engineering side of your research that you find it inspiring and and could also inspire others i mean engineering science art it's it's all creativity you know wherever ideas come deep within our, ourselves uh, is a is a mystery and when we come up with ideas when things pop in our mind it's it's almost a uh, a spiritual experience, at least for me it is. So I, I absolutely love creativity in, in any any domain of life. Engineering is, is fantastic because one can solve problems that so many people are faced with. And one can solve problems, you know, fairly quickly. If, if I can engineer a, a technology and actually productize it and get it out in a, in a decade and produce uh, a world in which people are limping around to a world where people are limping less. Uh, well, how fantastic is that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it's funny you just use the word spiritual then, because I was really interested to see that you are from a, a Mennonite family. And for, for people who don't know Mennonites as a, a sort of religious group, particularly in Pennsylvania, which is where you, where you were brought up, well, a lot of people get them confused with the Amish, but they're, they're sort of peaceful and I have in fact stayed with a Mennonite family in in Pennsylvania was did that background affect your way of thinking as uh, as well or was it more the influence of family I mean the the idea of believing in something even though you cannot see it is essential to creativity highly creative people they believe in something, often in, in a world where no one else believes it can exist, but they believe in it, it can exist. And they believe it so passionately that they, they work so hard and they crystallize the imag their imagination into a, a physical form in that creative process. So again, you know, believing without seeing is, is essential to creation. So in that sense, it, it does tie back to my early childhood and, and uh, the spirituality of my family. And do you still climb? I do still climb. Um, I, I rarely have the time, but I, I do enjoy getting out most definitely. And may I ask how many pairs of prosthetic legs do you have and their different functions? 
Well, I'm sur surrounded by about, probably about 40 different interfaces <laughs> in my <laughs> office. Um, but I, I have limbs for scuba diving, for running, for, for walking, for biking. You know, when, whenever an activity requires a distinct design, I'll, I'll certainly come up with that design and have my closet get fuller and fuller. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Hugh Hare, for joining me on the Create the Future podcast. I feel as though you've given me a glimpse of a better future. Thank you. I enjoyed being here today. <laughs>